when I went to Bible school many, many years ago before the earth crusted. We had a worship colloquium that we participated in. A colloquium is a kind of a mini course with a specific academic <clears throat> assignment to meet a particular requirement. And this particular worship colloquium called upon us in the people in my class, there's about 14 of us, to pick weekends, Sundays, and go downtown Denver, Colorado, and visit these various churches, a Catholic church, an Eastern Orthodox church, a Jewish synagogue, an Episcopalian church. And we, we had fun going to all of these churches. And the point of the uh, assignment was to not only observe the way these people worshiped in these various churches, but to observe the worship space. I suppose you know that there is a reason why when you walk into certain edifices that the space is differently ordered. In a typical Protestant church, you walk down the aisle, you're walking toward the pulpit, it is center, it is central. If you walk into a Catholic church, you walk down the aisle, you're not walking toward a pulpit. What are you walking toward? A table, not a pulpit. Why? Because in the Catholic mass, mass the, the sacrament is central, not the pulpit. That's why in an Episcopalian church, in, in a Presbyterian church, they have multiple pulpits. And the ultimate pulpit is the high pulpit, which towers over the congregation, where only certain people speak from. And, and, and worship space says a lot about what people think about God and about worship. And that is precisely, that is precisely what the colloquium was intending to teach us as students. For instance, when you go to the mass and you see the priest standing there in his gaudy robe, and he's, you know, he's doing that thing with the chalice and with the smoke coming out of it. And you can look at that and you can make all kinds of conclusions about it and you can think certain things perhaps negative about that until you realize what they're actually saying, what they're doing is the conviction is, and this is not limited to Catholicism, John Calvin taught this, that, that worship is supposed to involve all five senses, including the sense of smell. And so when the priest is doing that thing, he is getting the scent. He's putting in that, that sweet smell, the aroma. And by the way, they're not making this up. They get that right out of where? Out of the Old Testament, out of the tabernacle. God instructed Aaron and Moses about getting that smell because worship is to involve all five senses. So my point simply is, and I'm belaboring the point, but I'm simply trying to say that different worship styles and even the way the church is laid out, the way the walls are, everything in the church says something about how the people think about God. Now, the, the particular assignment in this colloquium says basically that our view of God informs the way we worship. Our view of God informs the way we worship. And we know that that is true. A.W. Tozer, in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, Tozer says that what we think about God is the most important thing about us. And Tozer says that no religion, no, no, no culture, no civilization has ever risen above what it believes about God. Why? Tozer concludes, he says, because we are drawn by a natural law of the soul 
toward our mental image of God. That is very true. But beyond the fact that our view of God informs our, our worship, I, I discovered a new twist to that, a new truth to that, and I owe this to Sky Jathani. I read his devotionals every morning, and Sky is a very astute, thought Christian. And um, here recently, he's been doing a series where he's been talking about worship, which in, which motivates my message today. And Sky Jathani says it's not just that our view of God informs the way we worship God. He says, hear this, he says, the way we worship God shapes our image of God. The way we are accustomed to worshiping God, the way we choose to worship God, the things that become normal in our worship practice, those things, those mental images, those attitudes, those practices, they shape our view, our image, our understanding of who God is. So let me ask you very quickly, among biblical characters, particularly in the Old Testament, if you had to pick one biblical Old Testament character as the worshiper, the worshiper at heart, who would you pick? David, amen. It's not just because we live in the same house why she said that. It's because we understand David, the, the psalmist, the sweet singer of Israel, the guy who is the worshiper at heart. David, Psalm 51, as he falls on his face in confession and repentance, David, all through the Psalms, the worshiper. Somebody has said, you don't get any closer to a New Testament relationship with God in the Old Testament than you get in the life of King David. When you look at his life, when you read his story, when you read his own words, you kind of, you almost like you're in the New Testament. And yet we find a very unusual story about David in the Bible. If you have your Bible, and if you care to, would you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 6? We're going we're gonna to linger there for just a few moments. 2 Samuel chapter 6. David says... In verse 8, was very angry over something the Lord did. And then in verse 9, it says that David was afraid of the Lord that day. Second Samuel 6, listen to how the chapter begins. Verses 1 and 2, and David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went out with them, with all the people who were with him from Baal, Ju Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubims. Let me just pause to fill in the blanks, even though I suspect this is very familiar to you. In the Old Testament, God instructed Moses to build an ark. The ark of the covenant, which sat in the holy place in the tabernacle, overlaid with gold, made of acacia wood, overlaid with pure gold, and on the top of the ark are two cherubims and the wings, you know, are kind of like that. And the people of Israel came to believe that the presence of God, the actual presence, literal presence of God dwelt where? 
between those wings in, of the cherubs above that ark. The ark was sacred. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, the Philistines attack Israel. Israel loses several battles and eventually they steal the ark and they take it away to their own territory. And you know the story of how the ark gave them trouble and eventually they tried to get rid of the ark. And for years, the ark had been sitting over some place in Obamedom's place. And now David is king and David wants to bring the ark back to Jerusalem, to the place where the ark is supposed to be. And so he builds a cart to put the ark on. And you know, you're not supposed to carry the ark on a cart. You're not supposed to touch the ark. It is sacred. It is holy. But he puts the ark on a cart. Uzzah and another guy are leading the, the, the oxen, carrying the ark. And the oxen stumbles along the way. Uzzah is afraid the ark might fall on the ground. This is holy. It's not supposed to fall on the ground. And he puts out his hand to stop the ark from falling. And God struck him dead. And David loses it. He's angry. David, the man after God's own heart, doesn't have God's heart in this moment. David, the worshiper at heart, isn't worshiping in this moment. He is, he is miffed. He's miffed. David, David says, God, you know that Uzzah, my servant, he did this innocently. He did this instinctively. He did this with good intention. And you kill him? Really? Really? To understand David and where David was in that moment, you have to observe what happens in the previous chapter, chapter five. We don't have time to scrutinize chapter five. So let me just give you quickly the three things that happen in chapter five. When you have time tonight, tomorrow, in your spirit time, in your, in your devotional time, read second Samuel's five and then chapter six. In chapter five, three things happen. In chapter five, David finally is crowned king over Judah. Remember, he was anointed king, but he spent a decade and a half or more running over the mountains and the hills for his life, afraid of Saul who wanted to kill him. But now Saul is dead and the men come together and they anoint David king. And so finally the battle with Saul is over and David is king. That's the first thing. Secondly, David conquers Jerusalem. Notice in chapter five that David conquers Jerusalem. David wanted a city, a strategic city to call the capital, God's capital on earth. And he conquers Jerusalem, he conquers the Jebusites. And there is a psalm where he writes about this. I think it's Psalm 68. He conquers Jerusalem. That's the second thing that happens. And thirdly, the third thing that, thing that happens is that David finally and fully defeats the Philistines. God's people had many enemy nations, but their chief enemy was the Philistines. And the Philistines made a, a habit of attacking Israel. And now David rose up and finally hit them so hard, they were, it was over. So here is conquest. He's crowned king. He sets up the capital city. He gets rid of the enemy. God is on his side. God is his battle axe. Chapter 5. David has just encountered victory over his enemies. God is good all the time. We are blessed and highly favored. That's the way we say it. This is chapter five is the blessed and highly favored chapter. 
Chapter five is the God is good all the time chapter. God is on David's side. In fact, notice what he says. I, I found this very, very intriguing. Look at verse 12, chapter five, verse 12. David acknowledges what I'm telling you. He says, the, the, the author says, so David knew that the Lord has est had established him as king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. You see that? David had a sense of confidence, a sense of victory, a sense of a sense of what's the word I'm looking for? A sense of invincibility. And then David comes to the next chapter and encounters God in a very, very different way, a way that, that is very, very um, the opposite of everything that happened in the previous chapter, and David doesn't know how to handle it because at this moment in David's life, at least, David is what we call a one-dimensional worshiper. In 2 Samuel 6, David encounters a dimension of God that was very different from what he'd experienced before in chapter 5. It was very unsettling. In chapter 5, David encountered the God who fought his battles. In chapter 6, David encountered the God whose wrath took his friend. And David is angry. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. A couple basic worship principles that you've heard before, but just it's good to hear them again. Number one, we were created for worship. Can we say that together? We were created for worship. That's very true. God, when he made us, he, he, he created us so that we would worship him. And we have that not only in Exodus 20, I am the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. Don't bow down to them. Don't serve them because I, the Lord, your God, I'm a jealous God. In Revelation chapter 4, we were created for his pleasure and for his pleasure we are and were created. And the word pleasure there is... God gets his greatest pleasure from our worship of him. Secondly, God is not indifferent as to how we worship him. Let's say that together. God is not indifferent as to how we worship him. We have Christians who tend to think that whatever, however I choose to worship God, that's my choice and he needs to take it. No, 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 no. God's not indifferent as to how we worship him. God is particular about how we worship him. If you don't believe me, ask Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10 if God cares about how we worship him. They brought strange fire, the Bible says, before God, and God struck them dead. God cares about the worship that we bring him. And thirdly, just three lessons, thirdly, we must worship God for all that he is, not the parts we like. We must worship God for the totality of his awesomeness, the totality of his glory and his beauty and even his wrath. And David didn't know how to do that, at least at that moment. It's rather strange because David is very versatile. David, when you read the Psalms, you get the feeling that David is a, is a student of this idea, but in that moment, he just wasn't handling that very well. 
Let me ask you to turn with me to three passages of scripture. First to Exodus 34 verses five through eight. We read them just now, or they were read for us beautifully. And now I want to just call your to your attention. The, the Lord descended in the clouds and stood with him there, with Moses there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. By no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. In this passage in Exodus 34, Yahweh proclaims his name to Moses. And in his name, in fact, we should say in his names, multiple names, he reveals the multi-dimensional nature of his being. He's the God of goodness. He's the God of mercy. He's the God of truth. He's the God, he's the God of compassion, full of compassion. But he's also the God who will not spare iniquity. He's the God who will punish sin. He's the God, he, he's, he's both. He's both. Moses, Moses sees the character and the nature of God and falls on his face in worship. We can say amen to that. Let me ask you to turn to another passage very quickly. Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, 28 through and 29. The author of Hebrews is finishing up a section where he is talking about Jesus. He begins this chapter by saying, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And, and he goes into a lot of details throughout this chapter. And now at the very end, Verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, in the previous verses, the author says that you think, if you think you've seen the shaking of the earth, you haven't seen anything yet, because God is yet going to shake the earth in a way that only those things that cannot be shaken will remain. And so now he says, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have what? Grace by which we may serve God how? Not, not the way we want to, not just whatever, 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 that we may serve him acceptably. And acceptably means with with reverence and godly fear, godly fear. And the reason we must do that, the reason we're reminded of this is because what God is a, God is a consuming fire. In this passage, we're reminded that God is a God of wrath. And we need to remind ourselves from time to time that this passage, this is in the New Testament. Because our tendency as New Covenant Christians is to divide everything. And we have the Old Testament God who's a God of wrath and the New Testament God is a God of love. And there the twain shall meet. But we're reminded in Acts chapter 5 how Ananias and Sapphira lied.
to the Holy Spirit and God struck him dead. That's in the New Testament. That God is a God of wrath. That God is a God of justice. That God is a God who eventually is going to come back to earth in the person of his son Jesus and ride on a horse conquering unto conquer and he'll eventually turn everything back over to the father and it is it is a wonderful wonderful thing to be on the right side of grace as we think about all of this but well, one more passage i want to show you john chapter 4 <clears throat> John chapter 4. This is very familiar. This is the story of the woman at the well of Samaria. This is the one place in the Bible where a prescription for worship, a definition of true worship is given. No place else. And it's wonderful because it's given by Jesus. John 4, 23 and 24, we all know it. Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well. He's just revealed to her her past, her background, the husband she had who was really not her husband, and the five other husbands she had had before. And she's shocked. She can't believe he knows all this about her. And so she tries to change the subject. Let's talk theology, Jesus. It's the automatic reflex when we're not comfortable with where the Spirit of God is taking us. Let's let's get a let's get past this spiritual conviction and just talk doctrine. Your people say we ought to worship in this mountain, and my people say that mountain. Okay, Jesus, which mountain is it? And Jesus says, Woman, you don't understand. The hour has come when neither in that mountain nor that mountain will people worship me. But those who worship me must worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Verse 23. But the hour is coming. And now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, because the Father is seeking such to worship him. There is a want ad in the post office that says wanted true worshipers. And what kind of worshipers are they? Those who worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And traditionally, when we read that sentence, spirit and truth, you know what we say? We say what that means is we got to make sure that our worship lines up with scripture. That we worship in the spirit, in the spirit meaning that we're spiritual people and that we worship, our, our worship is spiritual worship and that our worship is not just spiritual, but that it lines up with the truth of God's word. And nothing's wrong with that. Nothing's wrong with that. But I want to suggest to you today that there's another aspect of the meaning of the word truth that we, we too often skip over. That when Jesus said that, when he said to the woman, those who worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth, that he possibly wasn't talking about the Bible. He was saying, those who worship me must worship me with transparency, truth, truth. Transparency. You know why, you know where we get that? You know where I could get that out of this verse? Because the woman wanted to talk about worship and deal with worship apart from dealing with the truth about who she was. And Jesus had to reveal to her the truth about herself. You remember what the woman said when she ran to the village? leaving her water jar she ran to the village to call all her neighbors what did she say come see a man who did what who has told me everything about myself ain't nobody can do that except that guy <laughs> 
those who worship me must worship me in in the truth about who we are because we can't pretend to god there's no use going to god with our platitudes and with our sanctimoniousness and with our pretending and convincing God that we're okay. God, God's beyond that. Those who worship me must come to me in the truth about yourself. And the truth about ourselves is what a lot of us don't like to get to. Come see a man who has told me everything about myself. I am not going to worship God <laughs> with transparency. And, and, and this, is, this is where we come to the, <clears throat> to the subject, excuse me, of one dimensional worship. And, and this is where we are being invited to get beyond one dimensional worship. And let me tell you, if you do, here's what's on the other side of one dimensional worship. Beyond one dimensional, dimensional worship are many things, but I'm going to offer two today. Beyond one dimensional worship, number one is the freedom from the pressure. to drum up optimism. I listened to a podcast yesterday from Christianity Today magazine. They have a Christianity Daily Briefing. They release a podcast and the one yesterday was entitled The Case for Hope in a Year of Despair. And they talked about all the mass shootings and all of the trauma that our culture, our society is going through. And the question was, how do we move? How do we, how do we hope in the middle of all of this? And the, the, the subtitle to the podcast was, How to Move Past Christian Platitudes and um, I'm sorry. How to move past Christian platitudes and flimsy one-liners. I couldn't see that word. Flimsy one-liners to a robust faith in something greater than our present circumstances. And the gal who le leads the podcast, her name is Morgan Lee. And she was in tears through most of that, that, that discussion. She says, I... I she was talking about the shooting in Colorado Springs two weeks ago and the, the shooting sins at the Walmart. And she said, she says, people have no idea how this is affecting some people emotionally. And her interview was with a lady, interesting name, her name, Professor Carmen Imes. Carmen Imes, I-M-E-S, Carmen Joy Imes. And she's a professor um, and a wonderful, wonderful lady. And, and the questions were posed to her and she did a wonderful job of, of speaking into this. Why should we hope? And she says, we should hope because our faith is not rooted in our emotional selves or in our optimism but rather in the character of God, in the character of a God who created this world good and who has promised to be faithful. Listen to what she, our, our faith is not rooted in our optimism. A lot of us feel like we have to be optimistic for God. Otherwise, he might look bad. God doesn't need your optimism. God doesn't need your blessed and highly favored. God's, God's not propped up by the things you say. God is God all by himself. This takes the pressure off of me trying to drum up optimism all the time. 
our hope is not grounded in how optimistic we feel. Our hope is grounded in a God who is bigger than ourselves and bigger than our circumstances. Um, Carmen, Carmen Joy Ein says, we are never going to find hope by pasting a smile on our face in order to cheer things up a little, which is what we tend to do. On the other side, beyond one dimensional worship where God is only one way, the way you like, he's always giving you victory, he's always answering your prayers so you can say God is good all the time. Beyond that, you will come to discover the freedom from feeling like you have to be optimistic for God all the time. And then secondly, number two, you will discover the blessing of knowing and trusting a God that we don't always understand. That was David's problem. <clears throat> he couldn't understand how God could have killed Uzzah. I'm thinking of the story of Dr. D.A. Carson. D.A. Carson is a renowned professor at the Evangelical Divinity School in Dearborn, Michigan, I Illinois. <clears throat> and D.A. Carson, I heard him many years ago, tells the story um, of coming home from school one day from, from the office at the college and didn't realize his daughter had come home. She's 15 years old and he was walking down the hall past a room and he heard her sobbing and it concerned him. And what he knew is that she had lost her best friend. Her best friend in school had just died of, of leukemia. And he considered, he and his wife thought, well, she's handling it very well. But when he heard the cry in her room, he immediately figured, oh my goodness, something. And so he uninvitedly entered her space to find out what was the matter. And this is what she said to her dad. She said, Daddy, <clears throat> God could have saved my best friend, but he didn't, and I hate him. What do you say when your 15-year-old tells you that she hates God? For some Christians, it's a rebuke. How dare you say you hate God? But Dr. Carson was a trained theologian and he was capable. He knew how to handle this. And so instead he said to his daughter, he said, honey, thank you for sharing how you feel with me. And thank you for being honest with God. Because actually God, God knows everything and there's nothing we can hide from him. But Henny, before you write God off, um, I just have a question for you, okay? Here's a question. What kind of God do you want? Do you want a God who, even though he is all powerful and sovereign and almighty, is a bit like the genie in Aladdin's lamp. Always at the instantaneous command of whoever holds the lamp and whatever their wish is. And by the way, by the way, dear, you realize, don't you, that in that case, the person who holds the lamp is actually God, not God. The person who holds the lamp is really God. Do you really want a God who you can command at your whim every time you have a prayer or the way you want a prayer to turn out? If you had a God like that, would you really feel confident in God? <clears throat> 
Because he obeys you? Because he answers all your prayers the way you think he should? Or do you believe in the God of the Bible, the God who sometimes holds things from us, the God who reveals himself, but the God who has a part of himself that we cannot know, who from time to time doesn't give us a reason for the things that he does, which is what makes him God. This is what we have in the book of Job, by the way. In Job 3, Job cursed the day he was born. And, and one of the things that, that Carmen Joy Iam said yesterday, she said, you know, we, we come to the end of Job where God confronts Job and we kind of see that as a rebuke, like, you know, God is saying, who do you think you are? Let me throw some questions at you. But, but really, when we come to think about it, God didn't rebuke Job. God really, God really invites Job. God really, God really receives Job's questions. And God, God doesn't give Job answers to his questions. God simply gives Job himself. Because God is good. Because God is faithful. And because we know that this life isn't all there is to life. That there is a life after this. That people die. No matter what we do, people die. If taking exercise and eating diet food could stop us from dying, Jack LaLanne would still be here. But he's dead. We're all going that, in that direction. But the Apostle Paul says, if it were in this life only that we have hope, we would be what? We would be as men most miserable. Thank God we have a hope that goes beyond this life. And it is in that hope that we rest. And it is in that hope that Job could say, for I know that my Redeemer lives. And that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth, and though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh, I shall see God. My eyes shall behold him and not another. And when he has tried me, I will come forth as pure gold. Yes. We must worship God for all that he is. And next week, I'm going to go back to that very sentence and talk about how God is and how we are made in his image as multidimensional creatures of his because he is a multidimensional God and that we must worship him multidimensionally. Our worship can always focus and how he's going to give us victory. Because it creates a false sense of what we are about in this broken world in which we live. Yes, our image of God informs the way we worship. And yes, the way we worship shapes our image of God. And a high view of worship, a high view of worship results in a high view of God. Exalted worship results in an exalted view of God. And isn't that what in nominal, what we call nominal Christianity today, Everyone's doing, this is Advent. This is a season of Advent. And we don't do Advent in our branch of Christianity. But Advent is important to the scriptures and important to our lives. Advent, the, the coming of Christ in the incarnation. 
And there is nothing, there is nothing to compare as we think about this multi-dimensional God, when we think of the hope that we have in Jesus. And I love the song. I love the Advent song. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep. The silent star goes by, yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light for the hopes and the fears of all the years, not just this pandemic season, but all the years back when Jesus was born, back when Moses was born, back when Pharaoh decreed that all the kids should be killed, back when Herod said all the kids should be killed, back when Hitler said all the Jews should be killed, the hopes and fears of all the years are meant in Jesus, in this one person. In this hope we stand, and out of this hope we worship a God who is a God of love and truth and mercy and compassion and a God of wrath and judgment, and a God of justice, and a God who has committed himself to watching and caring for us from one generation to the next, and who says in the very end, I am renewing all things. Do you believe this? Amen.